Amen. Aren't you glad for that grace? Amen. Great singing. You may be seated. All right. Well, good evening, everyone. It is great to see you out. What a wonderful crowd here tonight for a Sunday evening. If you would take your word of God with me, please turn to 1 Corinthians chapter number 3 this evening. 1 Corinthians chapter number 3 tonight. If you would, this week, if you think of it, if you'd pray for myself and for Pastor Seth and also for uh, Katie and Lois, because they are going as well and have to put up with us that whole time. Uh, but we'll be leaving out sometime really early Tuesday morning and driving down to the border, uh, unloading either Wednesday night or Thursday morning. We don't know yet what that's going to look like. And then trying to be back here by maybe Friday night, maybe Saturday. We'll just see kind of how the week goes. But if you'd pray for us for safety, uh, pray for great weather. Um, Speaking from somebody that does a lot of traveling, it's so much more pleasant to drive in great weather. I don't like driving in the rain. Honestly, I'd rather drive in the snow than drive in the rain. You can ask my wife. That's how I feel about it. I don't know why. But if you'd pray for us, I know we'd certainly appreciate it. We're looking forward to the time of fellowship, uh, but we're also looking forward to just how the Lord's been working and been moving in our lives and being able to get to this point. Uh, was probably a little bit over... Three years ago now, when we had our first missions conference, which was here, I've talked about that before, how our first missions conference was here, and now, a little bit over three years later, we're at the point where we're, we're finally, right? But in the Lord's timing, we're getting to the mission field, so we're very excited about that. Here in 1 Corinthians chapter number 3, we're going to read the first nine verses, and then we'll pray this evening. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter number 3, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual But as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ, I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. For ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Who then is Paul and who is Apollos? But ministers by whom ye have believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. If you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, I like to mark things in my Bible. You, maybe you want to br- highlight that phrase there in verse number 9. For ye, we are laborers together with God. Laborers together with God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do love you. Lord, we do thank you for this evening. We thank you for just the opportunity to be here. Father, of course, we thank you for the freedoms we have in this country. Lord, that we can worship you openly. We can have a live stream, things like that. Lord, you're so good to us. Father, as we look at this, this passage now, I pray that you'll speak to us, that you'll open our hearts to something this evening, Lord, that you'll touch each and every one of us. Father, that you'll put me out of the way and speak through me. Lord, I pray that you'll use this message. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. What a privilege it is to labor with God, to labor for God. It's sad, but I think sometimes as Christians, and I don't want to say we're this way as a church because honestly, I'm... I don't want to, I shouldn't use the word impressed, but I am. I'm very impressed by the attitude and spirit oftentimes of the workers that are here at the church that do many things. We had our uh, meeting tonight, but, but it's sad that oftentimes as we travel around and go to different churches and things like that, we, we find that Christians see it as such a burden to have to serve the Lord, such a burden to have to go to church, a burden to have to teach a Sunday school and all these different things, but But that's the wrong attitude, the wrong mindset. It is a privilege and honor that we are counted worthy, that God has given us just a little portion that we get to to do with him. That verse there says we are laborers together with God. I wanted to preach a message tonight out of Romans chapter number 12, something the Lord has really been working in my heart there out of Romans chapter 12, verse number 1, about how, how it is our reasonable service to work for the Lord, a reasonable service. But, but the Lord had directed me to this passage instead. Um, I've actually been trying to preach that message for a few years now. You know, that's like a few years I've been trying to preach that message, but I haven't been able to yet. But here we are laborers together with God. 
Tonight we're going to move very quickly through verses uh, 1 through 4 and through verses 5 through 6. We'll move quickly, then we'll slow down a little bit on 7 and 8, but then we'll land there on verse number 9 on that phrase of being laborers together with God where we'll get the main part of our message. So here in 1 Corinthians chapter number 3 and verse number 1 through 4, this is Paul, of course, speaking. He's writing this letter to the church at Corinth. They were having a little bit of some issues at the time that Paul was writing to them to try to hammer out, to try to, try to help them through. Uh, spiritually, some issues that they had there in the church. And here in verse number one through four, you see that they're, they're arguing over whether they are a product of the work done by either Paul or Apollos. There's envying, Paul says. There's, there's strife and divisions. But it's over which apostle they came from, of whether it was Paul that they came from or Apollos that it came from. And then, then in verse number five and six, you see Paul is setting them straight showing them that it's not about the person that maybe had given them, shared the gospel with them, or the person that was the pastor, whatever it might be. It's not about that person, but it's about Jesus Christ, who is the one that does the work within us. It's not about the person that had reached them with the gospel, but it's about the Holy Spirit. It's about Jesus Christ, who is the one that does the work of salvation. It's about how God is the one who gives the increase In that labor, we see that there in verse number six, he says, I have planted, that's Paul, Apollos watered, but God giveth, God gave the increase. So it didn't matter if it was Paul that had reached them with the gospel. It didn't matter if it was Apollos that had reached them with the gospel, but it mattered that they were reached with the gospel and that that God had saved them. Sometimes in Christianity, we find ourselves gravitating towards a person in the ministry. And I hate to see it. It's sad to see it, but uh, we see it all the time, you know, like, oh, we almost worship this person. You can put that in your mind of who you see as maybe a great preacher or someone that's just a wonderful, wonderful pastor. And I love our pastor. We all love our pastor. But, but it's not about how great that person is. It's not about the pastor. It's about God, the God that we serve, the one that does the work through us. So here, this church is struggling with this. They're arguing and envying and strife about these different things, but it's about how God is the one who does the work of salvation. I thought of Romans chapter number one, verse number 16, which says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. He says, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. You see, it didn't matter about the person that shared the gospel with you because it's not us that does the saving, but it's Jesus Christ is the one who can save a person. So here Paul is working through these things uh, with these people here at this church of Corinth. And then we see there in verse number seven, look with me at verse number seven. I told pastor I was going to be quick tonight. Okay. So that's why we're, that's why we're moving. I told him I like to preach long. So I, I, I told him yesterday, I said, we'll be quick tonight. I promise. So here in verse number seven, verse number seven, the Bible says, so then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God giveth the increase. You see, neither job is more important than the other. God has different jobs for each and every one of us. God has a different plan for your life than his plan he has for my life. You see, God does not call every single one of us to the mission field. I say this all the time when I'm out at other churches preaching on missions and about being a gospel witness, that God doesn't call every single one of us to go to a foreign country to preach the gospel to the people there. Why? Because if every single one of us here tonight felt that we're called by God to go somewhere else to preach the gospel in another country, there would be nobody left here in Denver, Pennsylvania to be a gospel witness, to be a light here. So God doesn't call every single one of us to go somewhere else, but he does call every single one of us to do the work of the ministry, to be a gospel witness. God doesn't call every single one of us into full-time ministry. That doesn't mean that that person that God called into the ministry is any better than someone else that God didn't call into the ministry. Again, somebody else has to be the lighthouse at your job. Somebody has to be the lighthouse at that school. Somebody has to be the lighthouse there at that grocery store. Whatever it is, God has placed you where he has because he has a work for you to do. God has something different for each and every one of us. Here in verse number seven, he says, neither is he that planteth anything. We need to remember that there's nothing great about us. There's anything. Neither is he that planteth anything, nor he that watereth. 
So yes, maybe God called some into the full-time ministry. Maybe God uh, didn't call this person into the ministry. But there's nothing greater about either one of them because we are nothing. We are just filthy rags. We sang song after song tonight about the wonderful grace of Jesus. It is only because of the grace of Jesus that there is any reason we get to even have a part in God's ministry. Again, what a privilege it is because I am nothing. There's nothing great about me. Oftentimes, especially, here, I'll, I'll get transparent with you for a little bit, especially every month at the end of the month, when I get a list of what churches support us, so here's a little Missions 101, if that's okay. At the end of every month, so each church, you know, throughout the month that supports us, they send all their checks to our clearinghouse, and then at the end of the month, we get one lump sum that goes into our bank account, and I get a list, uh, an email from our clearinghouse with the name of the church, oftentimes the pastor, whatever, whosoever's name was probably on that check, and the check amount. And it is one of the most humbling things Every single month when I get that email, and I see now we're up to 35, 40 churches probably that support us, and there's some individuals that support us privately as well, how humbling it is that, that they take of their finances and give them to us to use in the work of the ministry. What, what do I deserve of that? I don't. We don't deserve that, but it's a privilege it's an honor that we have. Listen, neither is he that planteth anything, nor he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Verse number eight. Verse number eight. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. And every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Now this verse is very interesting because oftentimes in our 21st century American mind, we think of success and failure based off of numbers. But God doesn't judge us that way. God doesn't account us that way. That's the reason why here at a church we make, uh, we make an effort to let it be known that we're not about numbers. We're not about how many people can we get to sit in a seat just so that we can, we can put out on our live stream that, oh, we had 250 people here this Sunday. No, we're not about that. Why? Because God doesn't measure our labor based on our success in our minds. No, he says here that, that our reward is based on our labor, on the work that you do, on if you are faithful to what God has called you to do. Why? Because God has called us to different things. How can you measure up the, the, the amount of work that this person did versus what this person did when God has called them to two very separate things? Yet in our mind, that's how we do it. When we, when we think of well, maybe you meet another pastor or something like that, and you ask him, oh man, how many people do you have in your church? What does it matter? Their town size is different. Their culture is different. There may be three other Baptist churches, gospel preaching churches in that town that other people are going to. You see, we measure success and failure so much different than how God measures success and failure. Sometimes as Christians, we think that something we did for Christ failed because no one got saved, because no marriage was fixed because no life was changed for Jesus Christ. And we think, oh man, that all those hours we spent on that, that message really bombed because nobody got saved that night. That's not how success and failure is measured in God's eyes. It's up to God to give the increase. If that was the truth, then VBS was a failure, right, Pastor Seth? Why? Because as far as we know, we don't know anybody that had, gotten, that had received Christ as their Savior directly through the work that we had done that week. But I guarantee you that all the, all the labor that we put in that week is still counted as a reward through Jesus Christ because it's not about the fruit that we can produce, produce from the work that we do, but it's about our faithfulness to what God has called us to. Are you faithful to what God has called you to? Listen, this can also help you when you labor often for God and maybe don't see success, maybe don't see uh, a reward in your eyes because you don't see the immediate response of, of that gospel track that you handed out. Well, I handed out five gospel track, tracks last week, Brother Josh, and no one got saved, so I'm just going to give up. Sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? But this is, this is what we do in our mind without even realizing. Why? Because we, base our, we measure our success and our failure based on results. When God wants your faithfulness, he just wants you to work for him. 
He's given you that privilege, that honor that has been bestowed upon you to have, have a part in the work of Jesus Christ. We receive our reward based on our labor, not on man's idea of success. We receive our reward based on our labor, not on man's idea of success. Look at verse number eight again. Now, he that planteth and he that watereth are one, okay? So they're doing two different jobs. They're doing two totally different things at this point, but they're both laboring. It goes on. He that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. So we receive our reward based on our labor, not on man's idea of success. Okay, time out. We saw that we know that it's a privilege. It's an honor to get to serve the Lord, to get to have part in his ministry. And we'll look later at practical ways that we can do that, that we can labor for God. But not only is it just a privilege that the king of kings lets me serve him, he rewards me for it. How great is that? Here we go. Verse number nine. This is where we're landing tonight. For we are laborers together with God. Think about that phrase. We, me, I get to be a laborer together with you, with God. Wow. What an honor. That the King of Kings, the great God, the Creator, the Almighty, the I Am, the Alpha and the Omega, He allows me to labor with Him. He's allowed me to do that. He's allowed you to do that. And we, we think of it as a burden. We, we see it as, as just another thing we have to do in life. Well, it's night four of VBS, and I'm just tired. I don't want to go. I have to go. I told Pastor Seth I'd teach that teen class. I have to go. What an honor to labor with God, with him. We together as a church family, as Christians, get to labor with God. He allows me to, to work with him, to do his work. This verse goes on to say, we'll come back to this thought of laboring together with God, but it goes on to say here that ye are God's husbandry. That's talking about God's field, his, his tilled land, like a farmer will till his land before he plants a crop. We need to allow God to till our hearts to make us soft and tender like that field. Let God break up the hard clay so that we can be used for his glory. We need to, be, we need to have our hearts tender and soft and willing to do whatever it is that God wants for us. Why? Because it's his field. We've given our lives to Christ. If you've accepted him as your savior, you've given your life over to Christ. It's now his field to till and to do with as he wants it to as he wants to. That's why sometimes he may allow things to come into our life, some trial maybe to till some clay that's in our heart, to break up some fallow ground, something that needs to be broken up in our life to be used for him, where his husbandry. He says, for we are, we are God, ye are God's husbandry. Then he says, ye are God's building. We are God's building. Look with me at verse number 16 and 17 of this very chapter. Verse number 16 says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. So here we're talking about how our lives, how our bodies are God's very temple. We are his building. He dwells within us. It talks about how God is, God's temple is holy. We need to live a holy life. Why? Because we represent God's building. We are all about how we're in the midst of our building project right now. And we want everything in our building project to look all spick and span and perfect and clean and make sure the outside is uniform and all these different things. We spend all this time worrying about that, right? And those are great things to worry about. Don't get me wrong. But do you not forget that we are God's temple. Yes, this is the house of God. Don't get me wrong. My doctrine's not mixed up here. I understand. But we are also the temple of the living God. We're so much more worried about how clean the church looks. But then when we go home on a Monday and we show up to work, we don't matter how clean our life works. Ye are God's husbandry, his field. 
ye are God's building. But tonight we're, we're really focusing on this phrase here. I could spend a whole message on both of those, you know. But tonight we're focusing on this phrase on how we are laborers together with God. This passage here in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, of course, was we looked at it. Paul is talking to them about them being saved, about the time that they were saved, about their life being built for Jesus Christ. So we're talking about here being laborers together with God. We're talking about being involved in the work of giving the gospel, being involved in the work of helping someone who has been saved grow up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. We often use that when we're talking about raising children, right? But the Bible tells us that when we get saved, that we are God's children. We start as a babe that needs the milk, and we need to grow to where we can take the meat. So we're talking about working with God, being involved in laboring with God, doing God's work with God. The comfort that this verse, this very phrase, can give you, the comfort of knowing that when you're doing the work of God, whatever that might be, and we'll look at what that can be, when you're doing the work of God, the comfort of knowing that as you do the work of God, you are laboring together with him, that you are not alone, that he is with you every step of the way. What greater co-worker to have than God? Listen, there are fears in the ministry. There are hard times. I'll go back to being transparent. I thought about it this week, thinking about some of the fears that may come up in the ministry. Here's some, some fears that Katie and I have, are, are facing, have faced. October 3rd, we're moving to a new country, right? A fear is, will we have the support that we need to live in that country? Fear number one. Fear number two, will we be safe in another country? Things that I've thought about. Number three, how hard will it be to learn a new language? We've, we've started. We started learning Spanish. It's hard. I'm just being honest with you. For some of you, it might have been easy. It might be easy, and that's great. Praise the Lord. I'm having a hard time. We're having a hard, it's hard. Fear number four, when and how will we start a new church? In a new city, in a new culture, in a new language, in a new country. How is this going to work? Fears that come up. But then I think about this verse, and I remember that God has called me, I'm doing God's work. I know this is what he wants for my life. And he's laboring with me. He's alongside me. I don't have to worry. I don't even have to plan it out. He's got it all figured out. I just need to take that step of faith. Follow him. Laboring together with God. I said it before. What better coworker can I have than Jesus Christ? laboring together with God. Joshua 1.9 says, Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. So when I go down to Mexico City, God will still be here with you as you labor together with God here. And Katie and I, as we're in Mexico City, God's going to be there with us, laboring together there. The comfort the comfort that this can give you as you labor for God, as you do God's work, God's way. We don't have to be afraid. Why? Because God is with us. God is on our side. It applies to more than just those who are in full-time ministry. This applies to all who are doing the work of the Lord. As we sat here tonight and had our children's meeting, I saw maybe 1% of the people in here, probably less than 1% of the people that were sitting here were in full-time ministry. Why? Because it takes more than just those who are in full-time ministry to do the work of the Lord. This verse applies to anyone who is doing the work of God, that God is there with you. He is laboring alongside you. Well, perhaps you say, Brother Josh, you keep talking about working the work of God, laboring together with God. How do I do that? How do I get involved? How does that look? How does that apply to me? You, you're the missionary. You're the one who, who your full-time job is this. Well, you know what? I've got a job. I've got a life. I've got a family. That How do I get involved in this? I've got four points, I think. We'll see. I have four points on how we can labor together with God. How do we labor together with God? Number one, you must be born again. Keep your finger here. Turn with me to John chapter number three. John chapter number three. Number one, you must be born again. Before you can labor with God, you have to join his family. You have to get in the fight. John chapter number three. 
verse number one, the Bible says, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You see, when you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, when you realize that you are a sinner who deserves hell, that only the blood of Jesus Christ can wash away your sins, that you have to trust in him for salvation, then you can enter into God's family. Romans chapter number 10 verse 9 says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, that thou shalt be saved. John chapter number 1 verse 12 says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Before you in your life can look at laboring with God, before you can look at how you can serve God, you must first give your life to God. Accept him as your savior. Maybe there's never been that time in your life where you've accepted Jesus Christ as your savior. I urge you tonight to make the night of salvation. Call upon the name of the Lord and thou shalt be saved. So number one, you must be born again. Number two, a practical way that you can labor together with God is to share the gospel. Just simply share the gospel. There are so many passages in the New Testament where we as believers are commanded to be a gospel witness to the lost and dying world around us. Probably my favorite, I think it's one of the most concise and covers it very, very well, is Mark 16, 15. And he said unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. There's not a lot of room for getting confused there. To go into all the world and to preach the gospel to every creature. That command goes out to the Christian. At the time, he was sharing with, the, with his disciples there that were with him. So he said unto them, he tells them to go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. And they have, this command has been passed down to the church. It is now our responsibility as Christians to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We want to co-labor with God. We want to labor together with God. Well, God is in the saving business. Luke chapter number 19, verse number 10 says, For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. You see, when Jesus Christ came to this earth, he came to seek and to save that which was lost. He came to die on the cross for our sins. When he finished his earthly ministry, right before he left, he had commanded the Christians that were standing around him to go into all the world and to preach the gospel to every creature. You see, his earthly ministry was now finished. He's going to go up into heaven where the Bible tells us that he sits on the right hand of the throne of God. He makes intercession for us. The Bible tells us that he is preparing a place for us. But now it is our responsibility, those who are left here on the earth while we are here, it is our job to share the gospel with the world around us. This is how we labor together with God. Why? Because he's in the saving business. What he wants, he wants to see everyone saved. The Bible tells us that he is not willing that any should perish in second peter but that all should come to repentance now the sad truth is not every single person is going to get saved and no one that anyone that doesn't hear the gospel will not be saved because they don't know someone needs to tell them about jesus christ someone needs to share the gospel with them some opportunities that we have made available to you here through mount zion baptist church we have uh, organized visitation especially through the summer every thursday night I believe it's every Thursday night. Every Thursday night, organized visitation, an opportunity for you to come out and to join us, to labor together with us, with God, to share the gospel. Some visitation times. We also have uh, outreach events like the Denver Fair, National Night Out that's coming up this next Tuesday. The Denver Fair that's coming up in just a few weeks. That's coming quickly and we're going to need a lot of help, a lot of labor that's going to be, need to be done through that. That is an opportunity that we, that the church has offered for you to labor together with God, to share the gospel through outreach opportunities like visitation, like, like the Denver Fair and others. Number two, we are to share the gospel. Number three tonight, we are to teach others also. Teach others also. Turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter number two, 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter number two. Here, Paul writing to Timothy, 
calls him his son in the faith. He's training Timothy, preparing Timothy. Here in 2 Timothy chapter number 2, you see all throughout Scripture, we see men and women of God that are training others and teaching them through the Scripture. Here in 2 Timothy chapter number 2, Paul talking to Timothy in verse number 1, says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. You are to take the things that you learn through the scripture, okay? We've been talking about, right, um, you did your series on the flat earth theory, theory, and oftentimes people will go outside of the scripture to prove their theory. Oftentimes it won't be something that is preached from the pulpit. Why? Because up here we're supposed to be preaching from the scripture. So you take what you are learned through the scripture, what you have learned, what you have been taught, and you are to teach them to others around you. Train them in the way that they should go. Help them to understand what the scripture says. Take the things that you know that you have learned and share them with others. This is God's plan. This is a part of laboring together with God. Again, here at Mount Zion, we have many opportunities for you to do this. Again, I told you, I'm going to give you practical ways. Why? Because I want to help you tonight. The practical ways that you can take what you've learned, take the scriptures that you've learned, and teach them to others. You can get involved in teaching a Sunday school class. You can get involved in being a helper in a Sunday school class. We talked about that tonight in the, in the um, meeting that we had, that here very shortly we're going to have opportunities for more people that we need to help us in some of the Sunday school classes and things like that. There are more opportunities coming available for you to get involved in laboring together with God, teaching a Sunday school class. We have kids' classes on Wednesday night. There's a youth group. There's the Heatherwood ministry, which, if I'm not mistaken, still needs someone that wants to take that ministry upon them and, and lead it and help, uh, help see the kids over there at the Heatherwood uh, community that we have the opportunity to go in there and to teach them, the, to preach the gospel to them and teach them things from the scripture. These are opportunities that we have to teach others also. You can help out in things like VBS. Uh, we saw just a few weeks ago how many hands it takes to be able to put on something of that magnitude. And we had the biggest year, the most kids, I think, at 84 one night that we've ever had. And prayerfully, we can have an even bigger outreach in the community next year with even more children that we can reach with the gospel. What about discipling someone? I know a few of you in here tonight that, that I know are personally discipling someone outside of the church. That is, that is a great opportunity that you can go one-on-one -on -one and take the scriptures and open it up and, and show them. You can read a passage together and talk through it and help them understand what, what God is teaching us here in the scriptures. So we are to teach others also. So we can, to, in order to labor together with God, number one, you must be saved. Number two, a way we can do that is to share the gospel. Number three, to teach others also. And number four, number four, using the spiritual gifts and the talents that God has given you. Using the spiritual gifts and talents that God has given you. If you're taking notes tonight, write down Romans chapter number 12. Romans chapter number 12. For sake of time, I'm not going to read the passage, but that passage there talks about the spiritual gifts that God gives us uh, ways that he has, things that he has given into our lives specifically that we can use for his honor, for his glory, to, to uh, labor together with him. God has given each of us different gifts and different talents that we can use in the ministry for him. God has given you that talent in your life, whatever it may be. I don't, I don't know what it is. I know um, I used to know how to play the piano. I don't play anymore. I don't play any instrument now, but the work girls, they know how to play. What do you all play? The flute and, and the clarinet. Exactly. Yeah. They, they know how to play the flute and clarinet. I don't. That's not a talent that God has given me, but God has given it to them. And oftentimes we see them up here using that talent to, that God has given them to, to minister to others. That's laboring together with God. You can sing a solo. You can uh, help in other areas of ministry that we have. You can play an instrument, maybe even hosting a meal for someone. Many of you may have the, have the gift of hospitality. I understand that's not a gift that everybody has. Not everyone has the gift of opening up their home 
to, to have somebody come in and to host them for a meal and maybe play a game, whatever it may be. And you know what? If that's not your gift, that's okay. Why? Because God has something different for each and every one of us. It takes all the parts of the body working together to honor and to glorify him so that we can labor together. Remember, we're laboring together with God, with God. Helping maybe somebody that's, that's a little bit older and is struggling with projects around their yard. Helping the disabled. The list can go on and on. You know what talent or gift or desire that God has given you in your life. Maybe, maybe you don't know what that talent is. You don't know what that gift is. Go study Romans chapter number 12. Ask God to show you, God, what is it that you have given in my life that I can use in service for you? laboring together with God, using the talents that God has given us for service for him. Back in, back in 1 Corinthians chapter number 3, 1 Corinthians chapter number 3, as we close tonight, verse number 9. If you would read it together with me, 1 Corinthians chapter number 3, verse number 9. Let's begin. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. We have the honor and the privilege to serve God. What an honor it is. We have the opportunity to do God's work with God together. Maybe, maybe you've been discouraged. Discouraged about not seeing the fruits of your labor not seeing direct fruits to the work that you have done. Trust God. Allow him to do the work. For we are laborers together with God. There are many ways that we can get involved, and many of you do. Many of you are, are very faithful, but maybe, maybe somebody in here tonight just thinks, you know, I haven't, I haven't been a part of this labor. Get involved. What a joy. I often say there is nothing better in life than serving God. There's no greater joy, no greater joy. Let's pray, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do love you. Lord, we do thank you so much for your son. Lord, for sending him to die on the cross for our sins. Father, that we can have a home with you, that we can be a part of your family. Lord, I thank you so much for, for the privilege, for the honor that you've given me to, to serve you. Lord, to do your work. Father, help us to be encouraged this evening. Lord, help us to, to get more involved. Father, that we can see souls saved. Lord, that we can honor and glorify you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.